All right, so thank you guys so much for joining South Asian Heritage Month and Ruthless Magazine in this conversation um, for the first ever South Asian Heritage Month in the UK. Um, could you guys tell me a little bit about yourselves and a bit about your backgrounds? I'll let Simranjit go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my name is my name is Simranjit Singh. Um, I'm a professor and activist by training. Uh, I grew up in uh, in the states, uh, born and raised in Texas, and now I live in New York City. Uh, I have two little girls, and they're very cute and um, kind of the center of a lot of what I do. And so, uh, I felt really natural to get into uh, into into writing a children's book. It's something I'd always uh, dreamed of since since childhood. And um, and yeah, when when they were born, it was kind of like it's, it's time to do it. So thanks. Thanks for having us. I'm happy to be here. It's awesome. So my name is Bridgenda Gord and I live in the UK. I live in Wolverhampton, which is a wonderful city. Uh, it took a little while to warm up to it, but it's great. Um, so I work as a children's book illustrator and I'm also studying children's book illustration. And I think quite similar to what Simranjit Singh um, said about um, kids inspiring. So I don't have kids of my own, but I have nieces. And when they were born, I think I was really inspired to go into children's book illustration. So, I was thinking that that's not an American accent. Yeah. I, so I grew up in Birmingham. Oh. The road, not very far. Yeah, not far. I'm originally from Leicester, but oh, get, to, yeah. still pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell us a bit about about the the book you guys have collaborated on. How did this come about? What was the inspiration behind it? And why did you feel like you, you had to share Forja Singh's story, um, not just to adults, but to children too. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think I, I, I would probably start with my own childhood. I think um, growing up in a place where there was, uh, there was literally no one who looked like us. It was, it was me and my three brothers and we were in all of South Texas. We were the only ones really. And you could probably, uh, as you're talking about Birmingham and Leicester and Manchester and I'm like oh my god I wish <laughs> I wish I could have had that kind of uh, you know South Asian community growing up because we didn't have we didn't have anyone um, and so that that feeling of isolation and, and alienation um, I just remember as a kid thinking if, if there was a book that had uh, characters who look like my family maybe maybe things would be a little different. Maybe we'd be treated differently. So, so a lot of it, I mean, I think is, is kind of coming up in the conversation around why, why representation matters. Um, but it's something that I felt viscerally as a kid uh, and I've felt all through my life growing up in the States. Um, yeah, and I think, I think when, like I was saying, when my kids were born uh, and I realized no one had, no one had written books like this, um, that it was time for me to, to get started. That, that I couldn't wait any longer. And so I think that, that to me was like the real, the real impetus thinking about my own daughters and, uh, and thinking about what it, what it would feel like for them to feel like they belonged as, a, as opposed to feeling isolated like I did. Hmm. What about um, yourself? Well, um, I think the first time when I, when I heard of it from Kikila, I think it just felt like the perfect Cinderella shoe fit because I've always enjoyed um, just exploring and kind of drawing and observing people in our community, um, especially the elderly. I think I, I find them really inspir inspiring. Um, so it just, I don't know, it just felt right. Even whilst I was working on it, it felt like everything was leading up to this. Like, so. Did you yeah. guys know each other or, or how did this collaboration come about? Did you just drop out into a message and were like, I'd love to have you as an illustrator or what, what was the story here? Well, I, I knew of Buljinder. I'd been following her for a while. Um, I, she probably didn't know who I was, um, so I, it was it was more. Who you are? It was like a celebrity outreach. It was like a oh my god. So so here's kind of what happened in in the in the publishing world. You don't really. I didn't know this before I before I got into the process. But you don't really get to pick your your illustrator, and you don't really get oh, okay. much on the art. Um, but my my editor, who is also, she's half Punjabi. Um, she's one of the only in the industry who's who's Desi. Um, and so, as we were talking about it, she was like, "Do you know any any artists who you think could could pull this story off?" Um, and so, I, I actually gave her a list of maybe fifteen or twenty uh, Punjabi illustrators, and, and Buljender was number one, like the top the top choice. But you know, you never you never know how busy folks are and, and what they have going on in their lives. So. 
I just kind of gave her the list and crossed my fingers and, and hoped it all worked out. And unfortunately it did. So when did, when did your journey in illustration shop start, Bill Jinder? Um, well, I've always been drawing and making things. I think I've always been, uh, it's always come quite naturally to me, but I did, um, I did my art foundation in well, many, many years ago now, but I, I did an art foundation at uni and then I went mm -hmm. into doing graphic design and, and illustration. Um, but that's when I fell in love with it and I continued. And then last year is when I started doing a master's in children's book illustration. So it's been at least 10 to 15, 10, but yeah, between 10 to 15 years academically kind of pursuing. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Really, so I mean, I, I was looking at your, um, your Twitter page and um, I came across um, Guru Nanak and the Magnificent, that you, the project you've got going on. So is this, um, tell us a bit more about th that project. Yeah, so that was actually interesting enough. I started that as a, as a uni project back in 2014 and then um, uni finished and then I kind of continued with it afterwards several years later um and it came out last year um kind of which was perfect timing for the 550 years which wasn't planned yeah, yeah. It happened to kind of um go along with that so that was kind of a that was a deeply kind of passionate project that i was just kind of working on and off with and it finally came to fruition which is great i mean i i saw one of one of the one of the posts on twitter where you wrote when a kid comes up to you and hugs you and says Thank you for telling my story. I think that's something that we're so deeply lacking in the media, in, in, in academia, in, in, in so many industries is that representation. So the fact that you guys are doing this on the platform that you are is, is incredible. And I give you kudos for that. Um, wh why, why do you guys think that representation, not just in media, but in children's education books, so children's books is so important? Well, I'll start thinking about, you know, my own kids. I, I shared this story with Valjin there recently, and, and it's not exactly the way that I would have talked about this before I had kids. Um, but I think now realizing, right, I have two girls, uh, four years old and two years old, and realizing the, in the constant negative messages they get yeah. um, around all sorts of the first thing I noticed when they were born was I couldn't stop thinking and I couldn't stop noticing all the misogynistic messages around me. Oh. Like we live in New York City and there are signs and <laughs> posters everywhere. And I just, I just kept staring at them and being like, is this, is this what my daughters are going to see? And how do I, how do I protect their, their psychology from that? I, it, it just, it just totally threw me off. Um, and so as, as they've gotten older, one of, one of the bigger questions in my mind, you know, uh, racism is a, is a major problem here in the States, just as it is in the UK. Um, and a lot of my work comes around anti-racism. And so, so thinking about the ways in which, well, first thinking about the forms of negative messaging they receive, and then trying to think of counter messages. Um, and so there had always been this idea, like I said, and since my childhood of you know, kids books are, are the way to go or wh whatever else they consume, right? Like cartoons, television, film, yeah. like that's where our ideas and our conceptions of our heroes come from. And so what would it look like uh, to create a counter message that, that challenges a lot of our, our assumptions about who gets to be a hero and who is, and who yeah. is the villain? And so for me, like you, you mentioned, or Herbal Jinder mentioned the elderly, like having someone with a long, Dari, yeah, yeah. um, and someone who deals with disability, like the the dynamism of of Fojessing story. As I as I started learning, I was like, this is this is the story we need to tell our kids. These are these are the assumptions we need to undercut, and it does a lot of work in building them up, but it also does a lot of work in challenging mm -hmm. some of the negative, toxic stereotypes we we all have. And so that's that to me was like the real power of it. Yeah, um, I, I agree completely. I always feel like uh, children's picture books in particular are like, they're like seeds that are planted at a very young age and they, they stay with you. Like I, m some of my most kind of vivid memories are of the, mostly the visuals and the illustrations that I saw in picture books and how they stuck with me. And I remember I was talking to my husband the other day about just generally how, you know, anytime, I, I think there's even like a, a page for it or something, a look-a-sing. I don't know if anyone see that account. 
when you know every time you'll see like a single you know someone brown or something on tv everyone would be like you know gathering around and say hey look it's a sing and all of a sudden in that moment you feel validated like you feel yeah, like yeah. i exist and i matter and what i have to say matters and you know it's that whole thing of mirrors and windows um and they're really important because you know we you know we live in a in a in a space that's dominated by people that don't look like us so it's important to have that you know yeah, um, let me look at, um, as I was as I was about to get on this call, I was talking to my four year old, and I was telling her uh, she was asking what I was getting dressed up for because, <laughs> because yeah, and um, and and I said I was going to do an interview with Boljinder Pueji and 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 talk about uh, the book, and and she started asking me questions, right? And and she's growing and and curious, and and it was really interesting. One of the questions um, I ended up asking her was, "How does it make you feel to see?" Uh, a book with someone with a buggery, with a turban. Um, I speak was, Punjabi, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I'm, I'm just for anyone else who's watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who's not there, yeah. Um, but yeah, so so how does it make you feel? And I was like, she didn't say anything. And I was like, does it make you feel happy or sad or excited? You know, I was kind of prompting yeah, her absolutely. she not say anything. And she was like, you know, it doesn't really make me feel anything. And I was like, that's really interesting. Why, why doesn't it make you feel anything? And she was like, I have so many books with people with buggeries with turbans like it's like I, I I have lots of those books and so it was this really interesting thing where like that's that's why representation matters right like yeah. think about my own story of, of childhood where I, I I was so distraught like I was so anxious trying to find a single book to share with my friends and like we have as maybe as a counter like over correction we've we've stocked our books with all sorts of diverse books uh, so that you know, we we are teaching her all these all these aspects of of culture and community. Uh, but yeah, it was it's not it's not the reaction I would have wanted. But after she said it, I was like, oh yeah, that, I think that's yeah. what we're going for. Like at a point where it's just so normal that it doesn't really evoke emotion. Like it, it, it was a really cool moment. That's that's actually really really poignant when you think about it. When when a child sees these images so often, it becomes completely normal and natural. Whereas if I were, I've never, I've only ever come across one book where I've seen South Asian characters in it um, and, and a storyline based on South Asian um, person. And when I saw that, I literally picked it up and I was like, wow. I, I, I remember the day that I even saw it, I was about 15 years old. And after that, it's been very rare. You can go to like Waterstones and like one of the biggest um, retailers of books and stuff. But even then, the, I, I think I saw a fact um, written down that 6% of authors published in the UK are people of color. So the representation that we have in the publishing industry, in the literary industry, is actually really minute. Um, what, what sort of topics are you guys going to be covering in, in the future? Is, is storytelling for children going to continue? Um, have you guys got anything else lined up? What, what's the next step? Well, Jinder, you should you should start and talk about a little bit about your other books too, and why you're why you're such a big deal. But yeah, also what what else you're working on? I don't know how much I can reveal, <laughs> but um, definitely. I mean, I think this is all I want to do is really work for children's books and work in it, and that's what I want to dedicate myself to and be as good as I can with it in myself. Um, but yeah, definitely more books on the way. I don't know how much I can say at the moment, but they do involve. Um, protagonists from Punjabi backgrounds, and mostly, I think what I'm what I'm really interested is um, interested in is not just um, issues that the Punjabi or the Sikh community might go through, but issues more specifically as a diaspora. Because I think our, yeah. you know, what we really face is quite different because of the generational gaps. And what I've, what I've always been interested in what gets lost through that, what gets lost through communication, what gets lost through. The generations and how our understanding is different and trying to in some way um explore that in a kind of i don't know as authentically as i can you know so i think that's what i'm hope, hoping to kind of explore more with storytelling in the future and at the moment yeah. that sounds great um i wanted to touch a bit more um Samrichi saying on on your your work as a anti-racist um i saw that on on your your website and twitter uh, what how would you describe what an anti-racist is? And can a human being actually be a completely anti-racist? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it depends on how you define racism, right? So like, okay. if you understand racism as a set of 
uh, ideas that are embedded within our society and then instilled within each of us, um, then what it means to be anti-racist is to actively work against racism and, and against racist ideas and policies. And so I think it is, I think it is um, absolutely possible for all of us to be anti-racist, to be proactively engaged in dealing with racism. Um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's realistic to say that we will ever um, be able to, within our lifetimes, completely remove all the racist ideas that have come within us, right? All the white supremacy uh, that have come in its various forms. Um, but to aspire to that and to be engaged in that, totally, I think, I think it's what we can do and I think it's what we should be doing, for sure. I mean, you started um, a podcast after you saw the Black Lives Movements um, the, the, the amount of attention and the amount of coverage that you've gotten so far, why did you feel the need to start, start this podcast? And you've had, um, I think it's 12 episodes I st I've seen so far. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, um, it's, so, so a lot of my work in terms of my scholarship has come around, um, the intersection of religion and racism. So, so I look a lot at, and it's comes from my own life experience, right? Like what does it mean to look like, this <laughs> in, in America today, like it's not easy and, and, and what's going on. And so uh, that's where my scholarship has taken me. That's where my activism has taken me within racial justice circles and, and particularly um, among what we call Masa communities and anybody who is perceived to be Muslim in this country. Yeah. Uh, and and what, what has kind of, what the impact has been on them. Um, but yeah, in, in the last couple of months, um, as there has been increased attention to racial justice and, and with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, it felt like there was a new desire for people to learn. Like, I think one of the interesting things here has been uh, people have always paid lip service to uh, diversity or racial yeah. justice or whatever, but nobody actually cares. Um, and for some reason or another, uh, and I think there are a lot of reasons actually, uh, within the last couple of months, people have just started to care, like really actually care. Like they're showing up, they're risking their own safety uh, to protest. Um, there, you know, a lot of my friends who know I do this from high school and college are coming to me saying, hey, what should I read? Like people are actually reading, which yeah. <laughs> who even reads anymore? I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, see, seeing that, that yearning for, for education and understanding and, and like sincerely people just wanting to do better, yeah. That's where I was like, okay, I, I think that there's an audience for people like me who are willing to accept that we all have these ridiculous ideas in our heads and we want to we want to be better about them. I mean, what about yourself, Jinda? Do you think that the UK, have you had people messaging you on what to read um, and the response that you received since um, the Black Lives Movement gained so much attention? Um... It's interesting because just before that kind of, um, you know, you, you're making a joke there, who reads, it's true, because I'm trying to get back into the habit of reading, because I find myself drawing more than reading. But just a few months before that even kicked off, I was kind of um, trying to make more of an effort to read, and I picked up the book, um, uh, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. Yeah. It was interesting, and that got me thinking a lot. And I think it was quite probably quite difficult for me to digest because I knew that there was so much unlearning that I needed to do, and I'm still doing. Um, but I always find it. I always find like I need a lot of time to digest and process and kind of um, feel my way around things. And I think the only recently I did. Um, it was a, a, an image that you might have seen. It was um, it was about it was a, a young girl and she's painting herself white with white paint. And that was based on a story that my husband had told me about his cousin sister when she was really young. Um, everybody would you know um, make fun of her being a darker skin tone, and so she felt so insecure that she went and she painted herself in white gloss paint. And that white gloss paint is very difficult to take off um but the fact was that nobody you know asked her why she was doing it they just she just got told off for it and that really hit me because i know that i've been you know i've kind of grown up with a privilege where i've not i've never felt that kind of um pressure yeah yeah i've, ne I've never felt that kind of pressure and so but i know that in my husband's family a lot of his cousins have felt that kind of pressure because they they happen to have darker skin tones so just learning my way around that and just kind of i don't know realizing my own privilege has been a big thing 
yeah so even even through caste because you know i am deemed a higher caste than my, my husband so just seeing my privilege through that as well and seeing all the things that i haven't been affected by that he has you know so just on it's i think it's been more on a personal level than anything else yeah i mean i'm i'm a i've got four we're four, four girls all together in the family and we're all different skin tones completely and i'm the lightest um and it wasn't until very recently where they get out of the teenage bubble of being moody all the time where you can start actually having conversations with them and we had this conversation recently and I realized the different relationships they've had with the community and even within like family situations where i've been treated differently because i'm fairer versus my sisters who are who are of a darker skin tone it's still such a prevalent issue um colorism in south asian community how would you how would you guys say we can combat this issue um and would you would you consider right doing um a children's book on this it's interesting because actually since that since um trying to be more aware of it i've actually the book that i'm currently working on i've consciously made the the skin tone of my protagonist a lot darker and for me that's my way of kind of working through it and com like combining it to show that kind of representation and you know again it's back to normalizing it and making it it's absolutely fine and she's still beautiful and all of that so yeah what about yourself Samunji? yeah i appreciate that question i think it's um i think from what i've seen these 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 campaigns within communities require uh, collective effort and they require momentum um, and so so what it ends up being is like you know if both gender does her part and no one else is on board then nothing happens right there has to be a concerted effort from from multiple avenues that bring in that bring in that bring these issues to the fore and then and then we'll start having conversations I think from what I've seen uh, from my childhood is um, that typically within our South Asian mindset, we're really skeptical to, to have any sort of conversations that are inward looking. Like anytime, anytime like there's, there's an attempt to call ourselves out, um, you know, we, we end up focusing more on, you know, quieting it and talking about like the potential base fee or whatever, then, then with being like, oh yeah, that's a real problem. And so, you know, you could, it could be around domestic violence or substance abuse and alcoholism or whatever, colorism, racism, every single time I've seen it, it's just been totally dismissed as like, that's going to make us look bad, right? Like we have to keep our honor or whatever and, and, and we let it go. And so what I'm, what I'm seeing that's heartening um, is that young people, a lot of them are coming forward and being like, we need to address anti-blackness in our, in our community. And like, I guess, the, I guess the thing is there's, I've never seen that before. I've never seen so many people focusing on one issue like this. And so I, I do have, I really do have hope that we're going to start opening up this conversation and hopefully that'll lead us to other conversations around problematic areas for sure. Absolutely. I think, I think anti-blackness is one of the topics that we definitely need to be discussing in our communities and even, um, with the Black Lives Matter movement that's going on, I saw a lot of people continuing to, to have conversations in the community on Instagram and social media or in circles, talking about how we perceive black people in our community and the judgment that we give them. Um, one of the things that you mentioned actually was um, allyship and the importance of it. Um, could, you, could you just focus in a bit more about why you guys believe allyships with other communities and other networks is so, so important to South Asians and how, how it's going to progress out getting our voices out there? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there are a lot of ways in which we could talk about it, right? Like there's a strategic value um, of engaging and, and, and connecting and in solidarity with other folks. I think there's a spiritual value um, in which you, you know you feel more fulfilled when you are more connected with with your communities. Um, to me, I think it always comes down to to the ethical component, and it's it it feels it feels more intuitive to be in solidarity than it doesn't. I think because growing up, 
um, we used to hear so many accounts of our gurus, of uh, sakis, we call them. We used to hear so many sakis growing up of our gurus showing up for other people um, when they didn't have to, and, and they stood up for justice when they, when they didn't have to, and it was unconditional. And so to me, right, like the, the, the most powerful sakhi in that regard is that of Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib, who was approached by people who were being persecuted. Guru Tegh Bahadur wasn't being, and the Sikhs weren't being persecuted, but Guru Tegh Bahadur showed up, spoke up, um, and eventually was incarcerated and killed for it, right? Like that's the ultimate cost, and he didn't bat an eye. And so for me, it's, it's easier to look, <laughs> as a historian, it's easier to look at the past sometimes than it is at your own context. Um, but hearing his Saki and, and thinking like, this is what unconditional love looks like. To me, that's what anti-racism is, right? Like anti-racism is unconditional. You do the uh, right thing, the right reasons, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter if people are paying attention and it doesn't matter what the consequences are. That's, that's what I've learned from, from my sick teachings. And, and that is like the ethic that I, that I hope we can, at least for me, that's the ethic that I hope that I can aspire to. That's really beautiful, actually. The anti-racism is, um, is unconditional love. I might make that the title of the video. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bolton, tell us a bit about your experience of growing up in Leicester. Um, I mean, Leicester is quite a diverse city and there's quite a, quite a mix of South Asians and different ethnicity and races. So how did you find um, growing up in the city? It's really interesting that you mentioned anti-blackness, actually, because growing up, I remember having, I have very vivid memories of my parents saying, no, you're not going to hang around with that person because they're so-and-so. And, you know, um, so most of my friends were Asian, even though we had um, a very mixed kind of, population um but i mean i don't i don't feel i guess i should feel ashamed saying it but like i feel it's mostly i think it's um, come back to me when i when i when i know how to articulate what i want to say yes, no worries i mean so for instance i i i was born in denmark yeah and then we came to the uk when i was 10 years old yeah. and then we bounced around a lot which is the standard British immigration story, I find. Yeah. Um, and then we went, we moved to Aston, which you might have heard of, is a very predom predominantly South Asian community. And I went to school where I think we had one non-Asian person in our whole school, uh, which, which is probably the complete opposite experience of Simran Singh. Um, and then it was only at 16 when I moved away from Aston and I moved to Wales in this like really small village that I, I, I actually understood a bubble that I had been living in. And then I, when, when I moved to London, I, I really understood how diverse the, the world really is. But also um, the, the experience of South Asians across the world isn't what I've experienced by myself, where you do feel more welcomed and you do, you have, you can have discussions or you can go to school and be like, oh, did you watch that new Shah Rukh Khan movie? It was brilliant or whatever, like things like that. And I feel like because I had that comfortability growing up, I, I was allowed to experiment within my culture a bit as well. I mean, how, how was your exploration in your culture, Simran Singh's? Because um, not being surrounded by so many South Asians growing up. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's really interesting to hear you say that. And I, um, for my show yesterday, I just interviewed uh, Jennifer Harvey, who has a best-selling book now called Raising White Kids. Um, yeah. And one of the things she talked about how she, she's a white woman, and she went to a predominantly black school growing up. And as she was describing it, I was like, oh, that's so similar to how I experience. And then to hear you say the opposite, I'm like, wow, I couldn't even, I, I like literally can't even imagine. I think one of the real challenges and, and blessings at the same time um, was the, the pressure to be, um, to be the ambassador for an entire community. Yeah. So, so like, and this, this was, my, my parents framed it specifically around our Sikh identity, but it was true for like South Asian identity as well, that quite literally anybody who met us, it was probably going to be the only Sikh or South Asian they would meet. Uh, maybe in their lifetimes, or at least in, in those five to 10 years. So the impression, whatever impression we made, that was going to stick. And on the one hand, 
I remember thinking that was totally unfair. Um, and on the other hand, it was just reality. Like, it's not like, you know, when you're a kid, whatever your experience is, it's just normal. Like, it's, whether it's fair or unfair, it doesn't really matter. It's just what you know. Um, and so, yeah, I, I remember that pressure constantly to be on my best behavior in public because what what will people think of us? What what? And then on the other hand, right, and this is where I think it was a blessing, um, that really shaped my my theory of change within the world too, like, and my political worldview. I think, I think what I, what I learned through that is there's incredible power in knowing that you have the potential to shape someone's mm. impression of an entire people just in a single interaction. And so that, that gave me a, a lot of, it made me feel a lot of agency. Uh, in my interactions with people instead of I, I think it would be really easy in that situation to feel victimized but the way that our, our parents framed it for us it was like this is this is power like you have a yeah. unique power and and you should figure out how you want to leverage that and so that, that was really helpful that's so interesting because i think i felt that more when i started to wear the star at the age of 16 and i felt that then when i felt like okay i have a responsibility now i have to be in my best behavior but before that, it was just free for all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So as a, as a professor, I am like contractually obligated to mention Foucault at least once every time <laughs> I, <laughs> I talk. Um, but Foucault has this really interesting idea called technologies of the self, um, which, is, which is this idea that like the, the, the way that people engage with identity and quote-unquote ritual practice just like what they do every day it is it's it's utility is that it helps shape our, our internal fortitude and basically what he means by that is like and this was my experience growing up which is why i like this idea um by going out every single day in public and being like i need to be on my best behavior so that people what for whatever reason right so that people think that we're good people or, or so that people don't kill us on the street. Um, what that does is it makes you practice your values. And the more you're able to strengthen those values, the more capable you are to respond with those values when, when you're in a tough spot. And to me, that has been the best explanation I've been able to find when people say there's something really unique about how six respond to hate crimes. Like, yeah with anger they don't respond with hate they respond in, in different forms but it always comes down to love and like what what is it that allows them to do that i think it's i think it's that daily practice that that's something that, that we don't really see uh across the board in other communities i mean definitely well, you've literally hit the nail on the head like uh, i feel like the the way that the Sikh community and uh all across the world respond to so many issues with, with so much compassion and love um, and the way you just described it is absolutely beautiful. Um, so, but, um, well, Jinda, do you think the same as in the UK, um, the, the Sikh community, I mean, the Sikh community, how they respond to, to things going on in the, um, in around where we live? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think recently with COVID, I think we've seen huge kind of responses with that and just generally how Gurdwari have, um, become kind of epicenters for charity and langur and things like that. So. I mean, it's everywhere. Yeah. Could, you, could you just tell people what Langer is as well? Langer is, I, I guess it's loosely translated as the free kitchen, you know, so it's a uh, free food, which is usually vegetarian. Uh, well, it's, it is vegetarian um, and it's given out to everybody, the public, and it's free for everyone. But I think Sikh Prof would give a, a much more academic response to that. <laughs> word, word is nerdy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, mine is just my fairy. Yeah, it's free food. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, um, uh, the response that um, when I saw in, in America, when, when the protests were happening for Black Lives Matter, that um, so many Sikh communities gave out so much free food and water and, and shelter and masks and things like that. The, the way the, the community came together to stand with our black brothers and sisters and non-binary um, brothers and sisters was incredible. Um, one of the things actually, um, Simranjit Singh, um, I found on your website, um, 
and it really stood out to me because I felt like this growing up as well, was um, if they could garner mass support, um, they could confront racism head on, then why couldn't we? And I feel like as South Asians, there, there are a few issues on which we do not stand together. What are your thoughts on that? On that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's right. And I think um, here, is, here is where I find Sikh teachings to be really helpful for me as well, right? Like, I think it's easy to get lost in the complexities of, of reality, right? Like, we all have different life experiences. We all have different political perspectives. Like, the three of us are all South Asians in the diaspora. We have totally different life experiences. We have totally different worldviews. And, like, that's fine. Like, there is at least from what I've learned in my lifetime and, and through my um, and through my faith practice, um, that there's nothing really dehumanizing or there's nothing really negative about that diversity. I think that the challenge for us is to figure out where there is connectedness among our experiences, uh, kind of like we have been in this conversation, and then figuring out what is what is acceptable and not acceptable. I think what we lose sight of so often um, is is our priorities, right? Like we have these we have these buckets of things we care about, and, and we we're so focused on our own and, and so selfishly absorbed in our own sort of placing of things in buckets that we we forget sometimes of how they connect to other people's experiences. And so, so for me, this idea of ikongar, the, the oneness of humanity being the foundation of everything is really helpful, actually, right? Like, you could think of it, and, and most of us do, as, as just like some cool idea of, of, of a basic sick principle, and, and that, that's true. Uh, but it's actually functionally useful, quite useful, um, if you use that as a touchstone for your, for your decision making and for your activism. Um, I think if, if and when I've used it as a touchstone for my own activism, it's really helped orient me, almost like a compass. Um, when, when things get confusing and, and you end up in the complexity and, and within the, the entanglement of difference, uh, to, to try and go back to that place and say, how do I honor this difference while also honoring our connectedness? And what is, what is the right thing for, I mean, that's, that's what takes us back to anti-racism, right? Like, yeah. It do, it's not about me. It doesn't matter if I'm benefiting. It doesn't matter if I'm getting hurt, right? Like equal justice is equal justice. And so to me, that's, that's the framework that's been super helpful. I mean, Fulgender, what's your, what's your, been your experience in, uh, in the South Asian communities? Do you feel like we have a sense of unity or, or do you feel like that we kind of just stick to our own? Um, I don't know. I think it really depends on who you are. <laughs> I think it sure. and it depends on the things that you connect with as well because I think since I've been married um, my husband loves theatre and we've been going to a lot of theatre shows and especially a lot of kind of um, South Asian classical music, South Asian like, classical dance, all of these types of things and connecting to those things and I think it goes back to storytelling, the stories that you share, um, the stories you hear, the deeper you connect with one another and the deeper you connect with yourself as well because you realise hey we actually you know we, ha we have a lot of similarities as well. Um, and you connect on that kind of, um, with the humanity of someone else. So it, it depends what you're kind of feeding yourself and what environment you're in. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, would you guys ever consider expanding, um, respectively, individually, um, going into to adult books or going into doing a novel or, um, Bulchinda, would you ever do like a full on exhibition of just, just your illustrations? Um, what what's what are, what are your thinking in, for the future um i don't know what the future holds but i've I, uh from my heart i've never been really interested in exhibitions it's always been children's picture books um i think there's just something really powerful about that platform um just the way words and pictures work together in a kind of almost like a piece of music the way they go together and that's always been alluring to me so i'm not sure about anything else yet Yeah, I'm a I'm I'm a nerd at art. So uh, um, so writing writing is my thing. Um, I am working on an adult book. Um, it's called More of This, Please. It's also with Penguin Random House, and the uh, the 
basic impulse is, is sick wisdom for today's world. So, so, so I'm trying to figure out how to, how to say it exactly. I think, I think part, of, part of the challenge for me is that, like you were saying before, there, there are, it's not just children's books. There are no books that introduce Sikhism. Like if you go to any bookstore, you won't, you won't find one. Um, and so, so part of the challenge is introducing Sikhi while also introducing practical wisdom. And, and so that's what I'm trying to weave together through storytelling. Uh, so that's the vision for that book. Um, and then my uh, scholarly research yeah, is really focused on, on Guru Nanak Sahib and the earliest accounts of his life. And so my, my next dream project is to, uh, is to build on Baljinder's Guru Nanak the Magnificent and, and do an adult. I mean, let me say it this way, it's, it's crazy. There, it's been 50 years since, since any scholar has really written something meaningful, meaningful about Guru Nanak. It's, yeah, think about how many books come out every year on, on Jesus and Muhammad. And so, um, yeah, I'm really excited and, and eager to, to pull that book together next. Uh, I think that'll be fun. I'm, I'm a bit conscious of the time. So the, the last thing that I will ask you guys is, for the younger generation and people um, growing up in this environment, what would be the one teaching or saying or advice that you would give to them, just in general? Oof. <laughs> just something that you wish you'd heard growing up. Well, I, I would probably just say what I always say to myself, which is the three words are patience, persistence, and faith um, in whatever you're doing. Um, so whether whether it's uh, something that you're really passionate about, but just being not just patient with whatever skill you're building or whatever knowledge you're go delving into, but patient with yourself as well and persisting with yourself and having faith, not just in what you're doing, but in yourself. Um, I think there are three things that go a long way. That's great. I, I'm, I'm thinking of our conversation on representation and um, and how I wish I had models growing up. And so what I would say is, uh, that I wish somebody had told me when I was a kid. Um, don't feel limited by the models you have before you, right? Like I think before Bill Jinder was doing what she was doing, there's nobody like her doing what she's doing. Um, there is nobody doing, there was nobody doing what I'm doing. And so um, there are impulses within our community to do things the traditional way, but there are also a lot of people doing creative stuff and figuring out as they go. And that's uncomfortable, but it's also really fun and enjoyable and, 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 and meaningful for the community. So yeah, don't, don't, don't limit yourself to what you see. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. I really appreciate the conversation and the interview. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for being part of South Asian Heritage Month.